morning, we're going to be looking at the, the book of Jonah. Um, and so Thomas, Thomas Halley is on our leadership team here at Soyuz Church, and he's going to be bringing our message this morning. So let's put our hands together as Thomas comes and speaks. Thanks so much, Thomas. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear? Okay. Is that better? Um, before I start, I'd like us to familiarize ourselves with the story of the book of Jonah. And if you look in your Old Testament of your Bible, it's a book and it will take about eight minutes to read it. But to cut down the time, I've shortened it a little bit and I'd like you to watch the screen. This is a shortened version of the book of Jonah. Okay, so while we're waiting, um, just to let you know that the the book of Jonah is different from the other prophets in the Old Testament. There's a number of books named after prophets, and all of them, apart from Jonah, concentrate on the message that the prophet gave. Prophets are simply messengers from God, and you can read about their messages in these other books. You might have heard of Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, um, Micah. And there's a whole, Malachi, there's a number of others. But the difference about Jonah is the book of Jonah concentrates on his life and the events that happened to him. And there's actually only five words that are used in the original language, which are from his message. And those words are, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overturned. That's more than five in English when you translate it, but it's five Hebrew words. Um, how are we doing? Okay, right. So um, if the video doesn't work, that's not a problem. Um, I'm going to make it interactive because some of you have read the story of Jonah before. So you're going to help us out. What happened to Jonah when he ran away from God? Somebody shout it out. He was thrown thrown overboard. Wow, he was on a ship. He tried to go away from God on a ship, and he was thrown overboard. Then the storm that was brewing suddenly stopped, and he didn't die in the water. What happened? He was swallowed by a large fish. More of that later. The fish then vomited him out onto the onto the beach three days later. Then he decided he would do what God had told him to do, which was an unusual task, to go and speak to the the people in a city called Nineveh. And he did that. He told them, can anybody remember the message? Five words in Hebrew, but in English, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be destroyed or overturned. And amazingly, They all listened. They all believed. They all showed signs of wanting to change. They put on ashes and dust and wore clothes made of sackcloth, which is uncomfortable. And it's a sign that you are serious with God and you want to change. And God decided not to punish them because the people of Nineveh were very evil, as we'll see in a minute. You'd think after that that Jonah would be pleased. Now today, there's preachers who preach a message about God, and generally they want people to believe it. They want people to respond by saying, yes, I believe in God. I will follow God. Has anyone heard of Billy Graham? Billy Graham in the 20th century was a a preacher who preached in large venues like football stadiums. Thousands of people came to hear him, and when people heard his message, Many of them chose to believe in God, and that made him happy. He was grateful for being part of the process where people could come and turn back to God. But it wasn't like that with Jonah. Now, this is a very strange thing. There were 120,000 people in Nineveh who heard the message, yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overturned, and they repented, they changed. That's 120,000 people changing from worshipping other gods to worshipping the God of Israel. You'd think that he might be a bit happy. 
thank you, Carl. At last, these nasty people have changed. But no, when you read the story of Jonah, it's the other way around. Jonah actually was miserable. He was angry with God. He was upset that God would forgive these evil people. So we'll come back to this. But that's basically the main part of the story. And at the end, the unusual bit is where... Actually, I won't tell you that. We'll come back to it later. Okay, because it's a bit. That's a bit you might have heard in Sunday school if you went to Sunday school, or you might have heard it as part of general knowledge. But the bit at the end is the bit that often children are not told. So we'll come to that later. So Bailey, thank you so much. We've got major lessons from minor prophets, and what I'd like to do this morning is give an overview of the story of Jonah, overview of the book of Jonah, and the reason I want to do this is so that you can all go away and read it for yourself in the Bible this week and in the future. And I pray that God will speak to you through the book of Jonah as you read it in the next few days. So I want to do this overview by asking seven questions. And I hope that this will help us to understand some of the basics and how to interpret this book. First question is, how is the book of Jonah different from other books of the prophets? And I've already said that. Who can remember? How's it different? It's about his life, not about his message. Good. There is, there's a five words in Hebrew, I've told you. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overturned. Second question. Now, I think some people in this room may have asked this before. Is the fish story true? Okay, let's be honest. There's people in this world who have a problem with this story because of the incredible miracles. A man being swallowed by fish, staying there for three days, and then being vomited out. Some people in this world don't believe it. Some people think that the story is a parable. That's a story with a meaning. They think it was a made-up story. There wasn't a real Jonah, but he represents the people of Israel. The people of Israel were a stubborn people, and Jonah was a stubborn person. Some people think it's a made-up story to make a point. And others believe it's a true story, which contains not just one miracle, but several miracles. What about me? Well, I believe that the Jonah story is a true story. It actually happened, and the miracles in it happened, including Jonah being in a fish. Let me give you three reasons why I believe it's a real story. Firstly, the style that the book of Jonah is written is a history style of writing. If you look at other books in the Bible, like 1 Kings and 2 Kings, which are history books about the history of the kings of Israel, it's the same style of writing. It's not the style of writing of a made-up story. Secondly, the book of Jonah contains real people and real places. We'll look at the places in a minute, but Jonah was a real person. He's written about in the book of two kings. He had a message for one of the kings of Israel. There's also a mention of the king of Nineveh. You can do your research and find out about the people who ruled in the city of Nineveh. So it's not a made-up story. It's got real people and real places. And also, we've got the most important point in my view. Jesus mentioned Jonah. He didn't just mention him, he compared himself with Jonah. And when Jesus talks about Jonah, as we'll see later, he mentioned the story of Jonah being in the fish for three days and three nights. So as far as Jesus was concerned, he was talking about a real person who lived and somebody who actually experienced an incredible miracle. Third question. What is the point of the fish? Okay, I believe the fish story is true, but, but why? What's the point of it? Why have a random fish swallowing up a man in the middle of the sea? What's, what's it all about? What's the point of it? Why didn't God change the direction of the wind to blow the ship back to where it was supposed to be? Well, I'd like to show you a picture now which helps explain the significance of the fish. For those who can't see it clearly, this is a drawing 
which is from the illustrations of a book written in the 19th century by a man who excavated the ancient city of Nineveh. In other words, there was a man who organized archaeologists and people who were digging, and he organized them to dig up the ancient city of Nineveh, a real city in the Middle East, as we'll see. And while he was doing this, they uncovered all kinds of stones and carvings. And the picture in this picture is of human legs and a fish tail, which are kind of merged together in the same creature. This was a fish god by the name of Dagon or Dagon. And this is one of the gods that existed in the Middle East that people believed in. I'm not saying the god existed, but it's a fact that people believed in Dagon, including the people of Nineveh. So can you see what's going on here? There would have been a reason for the people of Nineveh to sit up and listen at the story that Jonah was telling. I'm sure Jonah didn't just say five words. He also would have spoken about his experiences. So he would have been able to say to them, okay, you believe in the fish god. Let me tell you about the god who commanded a fish to do whatever he wanted. Can you see what was going on? This wasn't just a random detail, Jonah swallowed by a fish. It was part of God's plan to get the message to the people of Nineveh so that they would believe it and so that they would change. Imagine, a fish god. Oh, we worship a fish god. But look, here's a god that's more powerful than everything in nature. He can control the wind. He can control even a mighty sea monster. Could have been a fish. Could have been a whale. The Hebrew word is just for a fish. But they didn't have the difference between fish and mammals in those days. So it could have been a fish. Could have been a whale. I don't know. The point is, it was big enough to swallow Jonah, and it was all part of God's purpose is to get this message to the people of Nineveh. Question four, where was Nineveh and why was it important? It really does help us to understand the geography so that we can see what's going on in this story. So Joppa is the place where Jonah sailed from to get away from God. Joppa today is called Yafo, and it's the port for the Israeli city Tel Aviv. It's still there. Tarshish, probably in the south of Spain. And Nineveh is way over to the east in Iraq. It's in northern Iraq, just outside the city of Mosul. And you can see from this picture really clearly what Jonah was doing. God told him, go east. 750 miles, no, I don't know, several, I can't remember the number of miles, it's like hundreds of miles to the east. But Jonah didn't do that. He went to the beach, went to the port, and got on the boat to go as just about as far as you could possibly imagine in the opposite direction. So he literally was running away from God. So let's think about this journey to Nineveh. If you did it today to go from Jonah's hometown in Israel to Mosul, which is the site of ancient Nineveh. Today, if you've got a car, you could drive it through the desert road, and that would be the quickest way. But they didn't have a road in the desert in those days, so Jonah would have had to go all the way through the northern route, which actually takes you through the place where the earthquake happened, in the borders of Turkey and Syria, the recent earthquake. So a long journey for Jonah to make. What do we know about this city, Nineveh? Well, this is a picture that was taken a few years ago, several years ago, of the ruins, some of the ruins of the city of Nineveh, just outside Mosul in Iraq. Today, I'm not sure if you'd be able to see this, because in 2014, um, a group known as the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria were involved in a conflict in the area, often known as ISIS. And ISIS were responsible for destroying a number of ancient ruins. 
So this may not be there, but the picture exists from a few years ago. It was a very large city. If you read the story in Jonah, it says that it was three days' journey just to walk from one end of Nineveh to the other. So a really big city. Loads of remains existed, even if they're not all there now. What else do we know about Nineveh? Well, Nineveh was the capital at the time of the Assyrian Empire. Okay, that's not the same as Syria, the Assyrian Empire, which was a region roughly corresponding to some of modern-day Iraq. Now, we know a lot about the Assyrian Empire, again, from archaeology. Here is a picture, which is from a bronze carving. It wasn't found in Nineveh, but it was found somewhere else in the Assyrian Empire. And I decided not to show you the whole picture. Um, it's a bit unclear, maybe at the back. It's a man with a helmet on. If I showed you the whole picture, um, I'd probably get into trouble because it's disgusting. The, there's people with parts of their body chopped off. It's not nice to look at. And the Assyrians were a ruthless, violent people. They did it deliberately to terrorize the countries that they conquered. It was their way of saying, don't mess with us. If you try to fight back, this is what will happen to you. Not only did they do this, mutilating bodies, they also had ways of torturing people. And again, I don't want to go into the details. It is really quite unpleasant. So this leads us on to the fifth question. And these, by the way, you can look it up on Google. The Balawat Gates. Um, you can find out that picture for yourself if you're really interested although it's not particularly encouraging. So the fifth question, why did Jonah try to run away from God? This is actually the most important question. If we understand this, it will help us to unpack the whole story of Jonah. Why did he want to run away from God? Is it because of the violence of the Assyrians? When I was preparing this message, I started to think, well, yes, that was the reason. All these people with their violence, mutilating bodies, he must have been scared. This could happen to him. It could happen to his family. There were all kinds of reasons why he wouldn't want to go to Nineveh. But actually, if you read the Bible carefully, in Jonah chapter 4, Jonah gives the reason why he tried to run away from God. And it wasn't because he was scared that he would personally get hurt. It was actually because he had no compassion for the people of Nineveh. And this is important. When Jonah answered God and told him why he ran away, or why he tried to run away, he actually quoted back to God God's own words, which are found first in Exodus chapter 34, when God revealed himself to Moses. God said, I am the Lord, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. And Jonah quoted that back to God, but not in a good way, like saying, oh, God, you're wonderful, you're merciful and kind. He said, I know you are compassionate, gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. But I don't like that because you want to forgive my enemies. And this kind of messes with our ideas of what's right and wrong. The way to understand the book of Jonah is to realize that Jonah is the villain. Normally you would expect the prophet, a man of God, to be a hero. You're supposed to follow the prophets, follow their example. Not with Jonah. It doesn't work. Let me show you what went on in this story. When Jonah was out on the sea, he was surrounded by sailors who weren't from his country. They were people who worshipped different gods. They were crying out to these different gods to save them from the storm. But then, when Jonah was thrown overboard and the sea calmed down, these sailors turned to God. And then in Nineveh, the people there worshipped Dagon and all kinds of other gods. They were evil people. But then, they changed. They heard the message, and they changed. They turned to God. On the other hand, Jonah was the prophet of Israel. You'd expect him to be the good guy. 
that he was angry with God. Let's look again. The people of other nations were receiving mercy from God. But Jonah was being unmerciful. It's all upside down. If you were coming here expecting to hear about a story about a prophet, oh yes, let's all be good people like the prophet. I have to disappoint you. Jonah is not a role model. Don't follow his example. That will help us to understand the book of Jonah. And now we get to the point which I think is the hardest question. This is a bit they don't tell you in Sunday school. The plant. What is the point of the plant? Now, because I stopped the, the explanation at the start, you haven't heard this yet, and you may not be familiar. Let me explain what happened. And you can read about this in Jonah chapter 4. After Jonah had preached, he went outside the city and sat down to wait and see what God would do. In other words, he wanted the city of Nineveh, where all the evil people were, he wanted that city to be destroyed. And while he was there, he tried to build a shelter, probably not a very good one. And then, by a miracle, God made a plant grow up that was big enough to shade Jonah. And he was really happy about that plant. It meant he could sit there in comfort, waiting for Nineveh to be destroyed, or so he thought. But then, God commanded a worm to come, and this worm ate the roots of the plant, and the plant died. So this meant Jonah had no shade from the sun. To make it worse, a scorching east wind came, and Jonah started to feel faint. He was angry. In fact, he was so angry, he wanted to die. Can you believe it? He's just preached to 120,000 people who've all repented and come to follow God, and he wants to die because he's a bit hot. But that's what the story says. He's so angry, he actually wants to die. And he said to God, I'm angry. What was God's response? Listen carefully. God said to Jonah, you have been concerned about this plant. You didn't plant it. You didn't help it grow. You're really concerned. You're getting worked up about this plant. Shouldn't I be concerned about this great city? The city of Nineveh has 120,000 people in it and many animals. And the Bible says that the people in Nineveh couldn't tell their right hand from their left hand. What does that mean? That's just a symbolic way of saying they don't know the difference between what's right and what's wrong. So in other words, God wasn't looking at the people of Nineveh and thinking, these are evil criminals. I want them to die because they deserve to die. No. God looked at these people of Nineveh, the ones that were part of a nation that was doing torture and mutilating bodies and all that. And God looked at them and he said, these are people who don't know the difference between right and wrong. These are people who don't know what they should be doing. God looked at them and saw them as lost. They're ignorant. They didn't know any better. And God said, they deserve a second chance. And they wanted to repent. They wanted to turn away from their evil. So God gave them a second chance, and he did not destroy their city. We might think happy ending. But Jonah was furious. That's not right. What's going to happen? Okay, you forgive them now. What are they going to do? What are they going to do next? I don't know what was going on in his head. But the story of the book of Jonah ends like that. It ends with Jonah angry with God and God saying, look, shouldn't I have compassion on these people who don't know any better? So really, this leaves us with a question. Even though we don't know what happened in the rest of Jonah's life, we have to ask ourselves a question. What about us? How does this apply to us? And I believe from this passage, there's a challenge to each one of us. If you're somebody who prays, 
we need to ask us, ourselves a question. What is our prayer life like? What are the kinds of things that we pray for? Do we pray for God to make us comfortable while we wait for our enemies to be destroyed? That's how Jonah prayed. But remember, Jonah is the villain. That's not how God wants us to pray. Or do we pray for God to have mercy on people who don't yet know him? That is how God wants us to pray. When Jesus taught his disciples to pray, you may have heard the words. He told them to pray like this, Our Father in heaven, may your name be honoured. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How should we pray? We should pray for God's will to be done. What is God's will? We know from the Bible that it is God's will that nobody should perish, that everyone should be saved. So if you're not sure what to pray about, ask God for the people who don't yet know him to be saved. Ask for God to give them a second chance. That includes people that we know. It includes people we don't know. It includes people that live in Brentwood and around Brentwood. It includes people who live further around the world. God wants all of them to be saved. He doesn't want any of them to perish. He is slow to anger, full of compassion, abounding in love. And he relents from sending calamity. That means he holds back from sending punishment because that is God's character. Final question, number seven. How does Jonah link with Jesus? Well, Jesus spoke about Jonah on more than one occasion. There's two mentioned in the book of Matthew. And I'm going to ask Gareth to read the first one for us, which is from Matthew chapter 12, verse 38 to 41. hear me? Lovely. Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. He answered, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the son of man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. Thanks, Gareth. So what is the sign of Jonah? On one hand, it's a picture, it's a picture of the resurrection. Just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the fish, in the same way, Jesus was three days and three nights in the burial cave. And then he came back to life. But the sign of Jonah is more than that. It's also the reason why Jonah was saved by the fish. It was so that the message could get to the people of Nineveh so that non-Jewish people could be forgiven by God. And when Jesus gave his message to people, Mainly it was Jewish people he started off talking to, but he also sometimes spoke to non-Jewish people. And When he did this, he came up with opposition. A lot of people didn't like it. And the next time Jesus spoke about Jonah was just after a miracle where he fed 4,000 people. Now, you might have heard 4,000 and thought, no, no, Jesus fed 5,000. Actually, if you read Matthew's Gospel, there's two occasions where Jesus feels feeds crowds. The first is 5,000 people, and they were Jewish people. The second was in a different location on the other side of Lake Galilee, and the people there were not Jewish people. So 4,000 non-Jewish people were fed miraculously using only seven loaves and a few fish. And it was after this miracle that people came up to Jesus. They were annoyed with him. They were religious leaders, Pharisees, and Sadducees, and it's in Matthew 16, 
And thanks, Gary. The Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him, asking him to show them a sign from heaven. He replied, when evening comes, you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning today, it will be stormy, stormy for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. Jesus then left them and went away. So once again, Jesus is talking about the sign of Jonah. So what is the sign of Jonah? Yes, we've seen it's a resurrection, a sign of the resurrection, a sign of non-Jewish people receiving mercy from God. But the sign of Jonah is not a miracle on demand. That's what these religious leaders wanted. They wanted Jesus to do a miracle for them. Give us a miracle. Just do it for us. Just to prove who you are. No. Jesus doesn't work like that. The sign of Jonah is not a miracle to make God's people comfortable. Remember, that's what Jonah wanted. But God didn't give Jonah a miracle of making the plant grow up just to make him comfortable. No. The sign of Jonah is that God wants to have mercy on people who don't know him yet. That is what God wants. That is his heart. Compassion for people who don't yet know him. There's so many lessons from the book of Jonah. Some of these um, are coming out in the daily devotions that will be sent to you this week. don't have time to go into detail now, but we could talk for hours about the problem of running away from God. The problem of misunderstanding God's love. The problem of the fear of foreigners or hatred of enemies. All of these are lessons from the book of Jonah. But now I want to finish with a final question. And that is, what is in our blind spot? If you drive a car, you can see what's in front of you. If you look in the mirrors, you can see what's behind you. But just to the side of you, there's what we call the blind spot. And there might be something dangerous in your blind spot, an overtaking car. What was Jonah's blind spot? His blind spot was hatred of his enemies. He hated the people of Nineveh. But he didn't realize that hatred was there. Here's a quote from an American preacher by the name of T.D. Jakes. Hatred is easily detected when we are victims, but hard to detect when it is in us. Hatred is easily detected when we are victims, but hard to detect when it's in us. In other words, we can look at other people and say they're, they're hateful people, they're horrible, and that's easy to see that, but it's hard to recognize when we hate someone. We excuse it. We say, well, that's okay. We're allowed to hate them because of what they did to us. But hatred is easily detected when we're the victim, but it's hard to detect when we're the one hating. Now, technology question. Do you think we might be able to see this video? Okay. If, you don't, if we don't get the chance to see the video today, let me recommend a song called Nineveh by a singer called Brooke Ligertwood. And she, um, she writes lots of songs. In fact, we may well be singing another song by her. Um, but this song is a response to the story of Jonah. And it's encouraging us to not follow the example of Jonah, not to be angry with God, but to be repentant, like the people of Nineveh who repented. This song includes words such as, Holy Spirit, let me see when there is Nineveh in me. And if possible, we'll listen to this song now. And if it's not possible, that's okay. I'll send a link to it in 
uh, daily devotion later this week. So you can always listen to the song then. And I'll hand over to Peter and Janine.